Um, for those of you who are not um, interested or expert in P53 biology, uh, HDM2 and HDMX are both uh, proteins, uh, components of a large multimolecular complex that exists in association with P53, primarily to limit P53 uh, function and stability. Uh, HDM2 has E3 ligase function, and it's capable of attaching ubiquitin to P53 and diverting it to the proteasome for destruction. Um, this relationship between HDM2 and P53 is not entirely monogamous. HDM2 does have other substrates, and P53 can be degraded by HDM2 independent mechanisms. But for all practical purposes, the interaction that I, that I have on this slide is the dominant regulator of P53 stability in a cell. This is the reason why P53 levels are critically low, almost undetectable, and unstressed cells. And the disruption of this interaction between HDM2 and P53 is the reason why P53 levels increase in the setting of cellular stress, such as in the case of hypoxia or DNA damage. The idea of targeting the interaction between HDM2 and P53 is not novel. In fact, I think it's actually two decades or more old. Um, the HDM2-P53 interaction is actually one of the first non-kinase targets selected by the pharmaceutical industry for, for drug development. And we are just now beginning to reap the uh, advantages of all of this research that has proceeded. Uh, and we now have as many, I think, as six HDM2 antagonists that are in phase one testing. Okay, why are we interested in this, specifically in renal cancer? And there are actually several reasons. The most glib is the uh, fact that in renal cancer, the P53 gene is almost always intact, neither mutated or deleted. Well, that simply means that if you had a drug that functions primarily through P53, the effect of the drug is not likely to be undermined by something as simple as the absence of the relevant target. But the real reason we're interested in this has to do with the biology of the molecule. Uh, I think most of everyone in this audience is familiar with the canonical P53 functions, which is to induce cell cycle arrest, to kill the cell through the induction of apoptosis or necrosis, or in some cases to induce cellular senescence. However, there are all sorts of uh, less well-advertised functions of P53 that have to do with its role in tissue remodeling. Uh, P53, for example, is intensely anti-angiogenic through a variety of mechanisms that I'll show later on. It's anti-inflammatory. It interferes with the recruitment of leukocytes into tumor tissue. It modifies the extracellular matrix. It has effects on cellular metabolism, generally through the diversion of cells from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. Now, the reason this is interesting is that across the board, these P53 effects on hypoxic tissue remodeling are almost exactly counter to those of hypoxia itself through HIF. We got interested in this primarily through our earlier work on the mechanisms by which tumors, especially RCC, develop resistance to VEGF antagonists. These tumor cells experience drugs that target the vasculature primarily as hypoxia. So it occurred to us if you had a drug that could limit the ability of tumor cells to adjust to the hypoxia triggered by angiogenesis disruption, you might have something that would prevent the early appearance of resistance and other clinical problems associated with the use of TKIs. So to test this idea, we took a uh, renal cell line and introduced a shRNA to P53 under the control of uh, tetracycline. And I'm just going to draw your attention on this rather busy figure. Uh, the bottom um, growth curve which is what you get when you implant these cells, allow them to grow to a fairly good size, and then treat the mouse with Sutent. What you see is a very brief period, maybe seven, 10 days, where the tumor doesn't grow, and then it begins to grow. I can assure you that if you were to study these cells under the microscope, you would see that in that compressed period of time of about a week, they do everything that you would expect to see in a uh, conventional tumor that responds initially in a patient and then later develops resistance. The tumors develop necrosis, they lose their vasculature, and then rapidly reacquire it within that rather narrow time frame. But I also want to draw your attention to this curve, which is what happens when you delete P53 from the cells. The point is, is that the curve overlaps that of our untreated control. In other words, if you do not allow P53 to come up in the setting of hypoxia that is induced by angiogenesis disruption, Sutent has no effect at all on the growth of these cells. 
But I also want to draw your attention back to the original curve. If the activation of P53 is such a big deal and so critical to the effectiveness of VEGF-targeted therapies, why is it that, at least in this cell line, the drugs work only briefly? Why is the effect so limited? And the answer is that because P53 activation and the consequences downstream are, in fact, rather limited in time. It's very easy to show the activation of P53 with tumor-associated hypoxia triggered by SUTAN. And you see most of the canonical genes that you would expect expressed here, NOXA, the gene that's associated with apoptosis, P21, and a lot of the others. When these tumors become resistant, which they tend to do rather easily, P53 levels are still maintained, almost at the same level. But what you see is the disappearance of many of the genes, in particular P21 and NOXA. So P53 function becomes progressively compromised as the uh, treatment proceeds, and in particular as the tumor develops resistance. Now part of this, <clears throat> we think, is due to the expression of this protein here, HDMX, a known P53 antagonist. Now I won't show you any data of this, but we have done a similar experiment with an HDMX shRNA, and it has the same effects as uh, an HDM2 antagonist. It prevents the emergence of resistance. We asked the question then if we could use an HDM2 antagonist that would raise P53 levels to extremely high levels. Would we be able to avoid the development of resistance? In other words, if we could just simply sustain P53 function, would that be sufficient to avoid the emergence of resistance? <clears throat> so these are just two xenografts, 786 and A498. And you can see in both cases, when you treat the cells with both SUTANT and an HDM2 antagonist, in this case, the Sanofi compound, MI319, the uh, development of resistance is at minimum delayed, if not, in fact, uh, prevented. This is what happens when you look at the Western blots. You can see that, in this case, you not only activate P53, which you can do with SUTAND alone, but you restore the function of P53. You can see P21 and NOXA and many of these P53-dependent genes restored. <coughs> One of the most dominant effects that we see in these cells that are treated both with a, a TKI and with an HDM2 antagonist is the profound lack of vasculature. I mentioned previously that P53 has antiangiogenic effects. Well, this is just a simplified version or view of all of the anti-angiogenic effects of P53. Some of them are mediated through microRNAs. Some of them are through the metabolism of collagen, in particular the generation of angiostatic peptides, such as endostatin or canstatin. But some of them are mediated through the suppression of HIF1 and HIF2. Now, the suppression of HIF1 is in the literature. That was actually reasonably well known. But there was no literature that suggested that P53 activation could suppress HIF2. <clears throat> so we actually looked at that. This is an IHC, or, uh, an immunohistochemical slide of uh, renal cancer xenografts treated with nothing with the P, uh, P53 agonist or HDM2 antagonist, MI319, SUTENT, or the combination of the two. And you can see the mark reduction in uh, HIF staining in these uh, slides. And it's better illustrated here with this bar graph, and in particular with this western blot, where you can see that HIF2 is markedly downmodulated in uh, cells treated with MI319 alone or in combination with SUTAN. Now, to investigate the mechanism by which this occurred, we did quite a bit of work that I won't show you, but uh, the mechanism is, in fact, P53 dependent. If you knock out P53, <coughs> excuse me, and then treat cells with uh, this HDM2 antagonist. You can see P53 activate here, not in the presence of the shRNA. HIF goes down here, but not here. So it's certainly P53 dependent. I uh, won't go into the details of it, but we showed that the loss of, P of uh, HIF2 here is mediated primarily at the level of protein stability. So we ask, is there a E3 ligase that could go after HIF2 that might be P53 inducible. And there is, actually. There's this protein called FBW7. It's a known P53 target. And if you look through the amino acid sequence of HIF2, there's two uh, recognition uh, uh, motifs for this uh, E3 ligase. So what we did here, I can get it back. Let 
if the reverse is not working. Can someone reverse this slide? It's just going forward. Okay. Um, what we did here is introduce an shRNA to FBW7, and we showed that um, when you treat the cells with uh, the uh, HDM2 antagonist MI319, P53 is induced, FBW7 is induced, but not here with the shRNA, and we lose this ability to downmodulate HIF. <coughs> now, the uh, ability of FBW7 to ubiquitinate and degrade HIF2 is dependent upon its prior state of phosphorylation. And most of the substrates of FBW7 require prior phosphorylation by this enzyme GSK3-beta. So if you knock out GSK3-beta, the effect of FBW7 induction is lost completely. So here's with the uh, shRNA. You treat with MI319, P53 is induced, GSK is not affected, but here the levels are low. Here HIF2 is downmodulated, here it's not. So this basically says that the downmodulation that we induce in vitro at least by activating P53 is not only FBW7 dependent, but critically dependent upon the activity of this enzyme, GSK3-beta. I'm just going to review one other angiogenic mechanism, if I have time, and that's the ability to suppress certain chemokines that attract uh, inflammatory leukocytes. Uh, SDF1, for example, is known to be a P53 target, and it's readily suppressed by using an HDM2 antagonist. Here's what happens when you treat uh, renal cancer xenografts with sutent. This is readily induced in the stroma primarily, primarily through hypoxia, and you can completely prevent that. If you look at the cells that they regulate, uh, these uh, inflammatory uh, myeloid cells, <coughs> you can see a few of these cells in the control. In our hands, the recruitment of these cells is actually increased with cimetinib, presumably because of tissue hypoxia. But you can almost completely prevent their influx into tumors by using uh, a P53 drug like MI319. This is just a bar graph illustrating the same principle. Uh, we've looked at these myeloid-derived cells that we isolated from the spleen of mice that were treated either with Sutent or with MI319 or with both drugs. And one of the things that's characteristic of these cells is that they make massive amounts of TGF-beta if they are taken from a mouse that got Sutent, but not from an untreated mouse and not from a mouse that got both uh, an HDM2 antagonist and um, a sunitinib. So these drugs not only regulate the trafficking of the cells, they also regulate their uh, function. Um, as you might surmise, the TGF-beta that these cells make <coughs> excuse me, is extremely clonogenic. If you incubate 786O cells with the supernatants from these cells, you get tons of colonies, with, which otherwise are hard to find. This is just an experiment to show that the effect on clonogenic effect, on uh, the ability to promote colony formation is limited to the cells that have both um, GR1 and CD11B expression. In other words, it's limited to this uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cell phenotype. Um, this, again, just examines the effect of treatment on the ability of these myeloid cells to promote clonogenicity. And as you can see here, I just want to draw your attention to the final two bar graphs. The effect is lost if the mice get treated with an HDM2 antagonist. So in conclusion, I'd just like to sum up one of the reasons why, or the reasons why we think HDM2 antagonists have potential specifically as adjuncts to VEGF-targeted therapies. One is that the concurrent HDM2 blockade does prevent the development of resistance to sunitinib. Part of this effect is through the additive anti-angiogenic -angio effects in which the HDM2 antagonist adds to uh, the anti-angiogenic effects of sunitinib. The use of these drugs in particular the Sanofi compound, MI319, is associated with a diminution in HIF2-alpha, possibly mediated through this E3 ligase FBW7. And we've shown that the inclusion of uh, an HDM2 antagonist interferes with the recruitment of uh, myeloid cells uh, to the uh, tumor. I'd just like to thank the AACR Curate and our kidney cancer spore for supporting this work. Thank you.